こと。あ、せいさん、どうぞ。もう今、日本語聞いてます、はい。日本語聞こえてます。大丈夫です。はい。はい、一旦始めましょう。もうあと時間が10分過ぎているので。はい。はい、わかりました。ありがとうございます。So, the, the, now the translator to English voice is not connected to the here.This is trouble, but the Japanese is clean. So, please say English and the Japanese people can hear, at least the Japanese people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> Okay. Lack of curiosity, take three. <laughs> so, once again, since we missed it earlier,、uh, I'm Sally Slowly,、um, here today, all the way from Sydney, Australia, which is a really long plane ride, but thankfully only two hours different, so no jet lag, which is very nice.、Um, something that's been bugging me for the last couple of years in the last few companies that I've been in. Is a lack of curiosity. And I very much see it as the silent killer of agility. I see people saying they're agile or trying to become agile, and yet there are no questions being asked. So, what is curiosity? Curiosity is that beautiful thing that makes us see a sign that says, Do not enter, and we want to enter. We want to know what's going on behind those doors. <clears throat> We see something happening that doesn't make sense in our context, and we want to know what's going on. Why? What would make someone act in a way that's completely different than we would? We want to question these things. And the cool part is, we all start off this way. If you've ever spent enough time around small children, you get very tired of questions and curiosity. It's the constant why. You need to eat your vegetables. Why? The sky is blue. Why? You need to go to bed now, please. And they ask why. So, we start off innately curious about absolutely everything around us. We touch things, we feel things, we taste things we're not supposed to because we want to know. But somewhere along the line, that goes away. And so, what we're going to look at is how does this manifest in the workplace when people have no curiosity? One of the things that I see. And if any of you saw Alex's talk earlier, you heard about evolving,、uh, evolving and improving over time.、Um, you'll notice they're working the exact same way. You know, you'll go in and you'll hang out with them for a while. You'll help them find some new ways of working. You come back six months to a year later, and their boards look exactly alike. And the routines that they're going through are exactly the same. Nothing has changed. They're just heads down going through the motions. And I see this all the time. Another thing you'll hear a lot is that this is the way we've always done things around here. Or the other awful version of it is well, management has signed off on this process or this way of working, and that's what we have to do. And nobody questions it. Nobody stops and says, why? Resistance to innovation. Somewhere along the last couple of years, Every time I walk into a company, I hear the same thing. And it's the only thing we have to fix is velocity. We have to deliver faster. We have to do more. We have to get there faster. Only this stops them from innovating. All they're doing is becoming a feature factory where someone tells them what to do. They go through the motions, they do it, they release it, and that's it. And you'll find this a lot where people you know, stop having retrospectives. They stop thinking about what's happening and they just go with whatever they've got. Even when things don't feel right, people don't question them. I was at a company recently and they had bought an agile transformation from people who know nothing about agility and they had all these playbooks and <clears throat> rules that they had to follow. And one day I jumped into their Scrum of Scrums meeting. Only as I looked around the Zoom window, I realized it was all the product owners. Scrum masters were nowhere to be found. And afterwards, I asked one of the managers, I said, Well, this was the Scrum of Scrums meeting, right? She says, Yeah. I said, well, Where were the Scrum masters? She was like, Oh, well, the playbook says that、uh, this meeting is for the product owners. I said, Well, do you have a product owner sync? And she said, Well, yeah. 
And I said, who attends that? She said, the product owners. It's kind of weird that we have two meetings for product owners. I don't get that. But she never thought to question it. They've been doing this for weeks. <laughs> no, no thought of, hey, should there be one from the, for the scrum master? Should there be a meeting for the team? It was just going through the most. And, and she looked at me like I was crazy when I started asking questions. Yeah, they focus on speed rather than improvement. They focus on meeting arbitrary deadlines. Um, managers love to set deadlines. And a lot of times when I ask them why, it's because they think that that is prompting their people to go faster. They figure if they have a deadline, they're going to get scared and they're going to work harder and you know get more things done. Only it has the exact opposite effect. So this is just a question that I want you to think about over the coming weeks as you go back into your office. Do you see a lack of curiosity in your workplace? Are you seeing some of the things that I've mentioned? Are you seeing other things? Really take the time to think about these things because what I'm hoping is that at the end, we'll have a couple of ways to potentially bring curiosity back to some of these workplaces. So next up is, so we've got this lack of curiosity, but is there a cause for it? Are there things within that work system that are making this happen, that are allowing this to become the prevalent thinking rather than people questioning what's happening? Okay, humans are fun. We like to compartmentalize things. We like things to be easy. We like routines. The challenge is that we know that routines are going to make us complacent. Routines are going to stifle innovation because why change anything? We get stuck in our comfort zones, and sometimes we don't want to get out of those comfort zones. And when you've got a lot of people doing the same thing, we'll stick in ruts and stay there for years. If they're not having new experiences, if they're not being exposed to new things, they're not even going to have ways to understand that there are challenges. Um, one of the things that I love to see happen is people working with other parts of the business, IT people working with marketing, marketing working with sales, sales working with HR, whatever it is to get experience from other people so you understand how you fit into that system. And so potentially they can start giving you feedback or you can start giving them feedback to make the entire system work better. Busy schedules. How many of you work with people or have calendars that are double, triple, and quadruple booked? <laughs> Most every C-suite manager that I run across has three and four meetings at a time every single day. And when you ask them, you know, do you go to all these meetings? They look at you and go, no. And they say, well, we just kind of wing it at the end. <laughs> but then they're missing out on so much good stuff. So they're not even curious about what they're missing with those other meetings. And they're not curious enough to stop and say, hey, is there something I can do about this? negative experiences. Um, I've worked with a lot of people that I honestly don't know how they get up and go to work in the morning because they get uh, yelled at, they get screamed at, they get told they're wrong, uh, they get torn down in front of other employees in a way that is shocking. Um, I've had people, you know, just put up with some insane nonsense and eventually that wears them down to the point where they don't even try anymore. It's not that they're not curious. They just don't care about anything anymore. They simply go through the motions and get through work. Um, rejection, failure constantly can make you just not want to put yourself out there, especially if your ideas are shunned frequently. I know that happened to me quite a few times. Uh, I spent about 20 years at Microsoft, and there were a couple of times when I could see the end result of something that was happening. And I would call it out and I would write it in an email and say, look, I'm pretty sure this is exactly what's going to happen if you follow through with this. Completely got dismissed every time. And two of those times I was absolutely spot on. And within six months to a year, my predictions came true. And still, <laughs> nobody ever asked, you know, how did you know? What did you see that we didn't? Hello, self-esteem. And this happens a lot too. You'll find people who just, you know, aren't as outgoing as other people. 
And sometimes they get left behind. And instead of, you know, empowering them and bringing out their voices and helping them or, you know, you being curious enough to help them, they get left behind and they quit trying to. They don't really feel like what they're saying is worthwhile because maybe nobody's listening to them. And that just becomes a never ending cycle. It's like a flat tire. Once it's flat, you're always on the flat side of it. Stress. Stress is another huge one. Depending on the type of work you do, your work can be stressful. Um, we used to joke in software that, you know, nothing really bad was going to happen. You know, yes, a website may go down for a little while, but nothing tragic was going to happen. And yet the stress was palpable. People were constantly under pressure to deliver and perform and, you know, to be there at the beginning of the day, you know, be the first one in and be the last one out. So you're perceived as doing more. But all of this leaves teams with no time to focus. There's no time for them to explore their own thoughts. Um, how many of you have been in a situation where you have a problem that you're having trouble solving and you're concentrating on it, you're focused on it, but then you take a walk? or you take a shower, or you start talking it out with someone else, just the act of talking out loud. Or my favorite is when you're trying to go to sleep and you're almost there and then you realize what you need to do. Um, if you don't have curiosity, you lose all of that and you stop thinking about these things altogether. There's just no room for curiosity when there's too much stress. Some cultures and societies uh, prefer conformity and, you know, the way things always were. There are a lot of places where that is helpful. Uh, you think about things like manufacturing. If you do the same thing over and over, the risk of you getting hurt is far less. So you don't end up curious about it. But in that instance, it's actually okay. But you've got to be able to have a safe place to explore. You've got to create a safe space for people to want to try new things and for people to be receptive to those new things. Uh, additional type of stress coming from overburden. Almost every company I walk into has, you know, anywhere between a year to five years worth of work in the backlog. And sometimes when I ask them about it, they say the same thing. Well, it all has to get done. I saw someone who was working in sprints and every single sprint they were taking on two to three times as much work as they could possibly get done in their iteration timeline. And yet when I asked, you know, maybe we could think about which are the most important things we can work on those first. The response was, no, it all has to get done anyway. So what difference does it make? And again, it's one of those things where I prompt questions that I hope will get people curious and they just shut down completely and it just becomes part of their work. So with all those good things happening, what I want you to think about is what can we do? What can we do as individuals? What can we do as a team? What can we introduce that might help bring curiosity back? Creating a space where people feel safe to experiment. Uh, one of my favorite stories was from a place called uh, Nordstrom. It's a big shopping center in Seattle, and they created something back in the day called the Nordstrom Innovation Lab. They had a fantastically huge budget to do whatever they needed, and they were, bit, they were actually told that they could fail up to what was it, 90, 95% of the time, 80% allowed to fail. So what the manager said was go create new things, go talk to our customers, experiment like crazy. You come up with an insane idea, go see if you can make it happen because you're going to be safe to do this. And the incredible things that they did were amazing to watch. You can still see videos online on YouTube of them sitting in a shopping store, talking to customers and creating things on the fly, you know, getting that involvement. Share failures and learn together. Um, Agilists talk a lot about retrospectives, but a lot of times I see it only at the team level. Retrospectives with managers, managers with managers, <laughs> IT people with, you know, marketing people. Have those retrospectives. Make it a safe place for them to share what's happening because everybody's got a different perspective on what's happening. Encourage people to learn and share new things. I love being able to create stuff like this. I've seen teams where they'll do book clubs 
and once a month someone will read a book that everybody's kind of voted on and then they'll come back and share you know over lunch or over a one hour standing meeting or managers will say okay we're going to set aside time for learning and i'm going to bring in guest speakers on whatever topics you want to talk about it just creates this environment where people are curious and want to learn setting goals instead of setting up um you know, different ways of just looking at what you're doing, set up those small goals in your team, you know, say we're going to experiment with things, but set up some guardrails so that you, you know, if it does fail, it doesn't fail too badly. Um, take the wins, celebrate those and make that a habit, you know, figure out how good it feels to innovate, how good it feels to try new things and keep that something that you want to do. Meetups. I love getting people to start going to meetups, start networking within their company and their community. Uh, a lot of times, you know, I'll go in and talk to people about agility and Scrum and Kanban and all these wonderful things. But to them, it's just this thing that they do for work. But when they'll join us in the community and actually hear people talking about it and sharing stories about what a difference it made for them and their culture, um, it becomes something that they want to learn more about. create that environment where learning never stops. Um, so often I'll go in and people will ask me to do different types of trainings, but then at a certain point they come back and say, okay, okay, they've had enough training. They, they have to work now. They don't have enough time for this. And when you really look at it, it's, um, it's kind of like when people say they don't have enough time to do the scrum events. Well, they're really not that big and they really don't take up all that much time, but it's that perception that you have to be working and not learning. But again, if you're not evolving and you're not learning, you're dying. And in today's society, and especially in knowledge work, you fall behind, it's going to be real hard to pick that back up. Like I said, pair people with different parts of the business. I had a company at one point that had a roster. And uh, I, think it was, I think it was every three weeks, we would go and have coffee with someone that we didn't know from a completely different part of the company. And you would just go and you would spend an hour and you would talk to them about, you know, what their job is. You'd share stories about the work. It was fantastic. I met so many interesting people that in a company that size, nobody would have met otherwise. I, I love when teams tell me they're agile and I, they talk about, you know, customer focus and user stories, and yet they've never met a customer. And they've never thought to ask why. <laughs> you know, we build these things for our customers. And what's so great is when you get people engaged with their customers, they start to realize that they're not just building this stuff in a bubble. They're building it for someone. They're making someone's lives easier or someone's workplace better. And when they have someone, when they have a face in mind that they can think about as they're working, it improves everything because they're always going to be looking for ways to make things better for those people. Oh, sorry, I went backwards. This is one of my new favorite things that I stumbled across. Create competence goals. Create goals, or a lot of people use KPIs, key performance indicators. Create ones that are based on how much did this employee learn over the course of the year? How much effort did they put into making their skill set better? rather than just, you know, did you perform? Did you, you know, did you uh, get enough story points out the door? And a little bit that I want to leave you with is another question that I want you to ponder over the next couple of weeks is, can you think of additional ways that you could spark curiosity in your workplace? Um, I came up with a few that were based on my experiences, but all of you are going to have different experiences as well. Think about those people. Think about how they interact together. See if you can maybe come up with a way. And even if you can't, have a retrospective and talk to other people. Get all those voices in the room and see what you might want to experiment with. And the last question I want you to take home with you is what are you going to do next week to spark curiosity in yourself? A lot of us have been really busy and had a really crazy year last year. How can you take a step back and start with yourself fostering that curiosity? 
And that is me. If you want to get in touch, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm occasionally on Twitter, hoping to be more. Uh, I've also got my personal website. And for those of you who haven't run across me yet, uh, back in July, I started hashtag Stop Bad Agile on LinkedIn. I would love to have you all go to LinkedIn, look up that hashtag and find me. Um, what's been going on a lot in Sydney, Australia, is that people are selling bad agile. They're selling things that they know are going to hurt companies or set them back or never help them create any sort of agility at all. But it's popular and it's being sold. And so what I've done is all these birds that you've seen, I've drawn them as a way to highlight what these things are, hoping to spark curiosity in people to go, well, if that's not the way, what is? And so I'm hoping to keep that conversation going. So please join me on LinkedIn and uh, be sure to participate. Let me know what you think of them. Let me know if you agree or disagree. I'm loving the conversations that have happened. And with that, uh, any questions? Uh, sorry, uh, no, and translation from Japanese to English, it does not work. So <laughs> please uh, uh, ask a question in English. What's the worst bad edge you ever seen? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, the worst right now is a company that has three different things that they're calling agile op models. Depending on the company they go to or whoever they haven't abused yet, they bring out a different one. And sometimes they tweak them. But essentially what they've done, they've taken what doesn't exist as a Spotify model. They've taken the worst parts of safe and they've taken really bad scrum and they've turned it into an enforcement policy. Everyone has to work exactly the same way, at exactly the same time, do the exact same events in the exact same way at the exact same time. Everyone has to use the exact same tools. Every single team or department across the company has to have the exact same roles. Now, it doesn't matter that these roles don't exist and there are no people who can fulfill these job descriptions. You must comply. And they actually put it into a computer and you can look up at any time who's not in compliance with the op model. It's terrifying. And this was one of those places where nobody questioned it. This was where the, the scrum of scrums came from. And they're just like, what do you mean that's for scrum masters? Like, but it's in the title. Uh, yeah. And what really hurts is that they go and they train people up as scrum masters and agile coaches under this. And they tell them, yes, this is the way. Go out and do this. And so they move on to another company. And they're spreading this. And right now, I can tell just from job descriptions of scrum masters, product owners, and agile coaches online exactly who's been affected by this because they force you to comply with the language as well. You're not allowed to use scrum terminology. You have to use their version of it. And so it's really creating a place where people spend years in these environments and they think they're doing good agile, but they're not. And it's, it's almost a self-perpetuating system. Um, I see people, I see bad things and misinformation spread farther and faster than correct information ever does. Because correct information is a little bit more difficult. It's a little bit harder to wrap your head around sometimes. You've probably heard people tell you that you know, Scrum is too theoretical. Oh, that can't work here. What these kind of op models do is they make it seem simple. They make it seem very color by numbers. Oh, if you just put the green in box number one across the thing, you're going to have a forest, but you're not. Did that overly help? <laughs> yeah, hence the birds. I've, I've been burned by a lot of really, really bad things. And I've, I've sat in rooms where 10 people are saying, this is agile, and I'm over here going, but, but no, it's not. And the manager looks over and goes, oh, 10 to 1. I'll stick with them. <laughs> it's a little crazy. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> to continue the bird metaphor, um, can you give some examples of uh, canaries in a coal mine that uh, 
um, are early signs that uh, curiosity is, uh, is taking a hit. So how can you recognize it before the board stagnate and people uh, grow despondent? Oh. One that I see quite often is even when people are new to things like Scrum and the events, they immediately want to get rid of them. They've been through maybe three or four retrospectives and they say, oh, we've, we've done enough. We've fixed all of our problems. We're finished. Um, and from the outside, you know that's not true. <laughs> you, you watch them being sad. You watch them not getting you know, through the work that they expected to. You see and hear what's going on. That's a really big one. Um, another one is when people will question decisions that have been made by management. And immediately they're told, well, you know, so-and-so at this level has already bought off on it, so we're done now. Um, that's the way it's got to be. And you'll just watch them, you know, kind of put their hands down. And you can see where this is going. They're already being stifled from questioning. So those are probably two of the biggest ones that happen the most frequently. Has anybody else seen anything that showed a lack of curiosity? You ever seen anything? I think getting back to, you mentioned today, Heidi, empathy, right? I think uh, that is definitely linked perhaps to curiosity. Um, if you don't have empathy for someone, I suppose, you're, you may not be able to be curious about what they experience anymore, right? Because there's no empathy. So curiosity, maybe curiosity is in uh, maybe it's more than just questioning. Maybe curiosity is an emotion. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, and I think I think that's part of how it manifests when it's coming from management. They don't understand what it's like to be a worker on the ground. They don't understand the pressures and the things that are being asked of them. All they see is numbers on a spreadsheet. And so they kind of enforce compliance with things that they, they don't even think to try to understand what's going on at the ground level. Hi, uh, question. So in a coaching context, let's say you're coaching a team or department or group of people, what are your kind of favorite techniques to introduce curiosity? Hmm. Typically, I try not to so much introduce it because I'm afraid if I were to, you know, show something like this or start talking about what I'm seeing as a lack of curiosity, um, I fear that they would clam up even more. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll try to come up with retrospectives, something that matters to them, um, something that I can use. Uh, one of my favorites is getting people to have, you know, I've got a deck of cards with all sorts of pictures on them different things, some good, some bad, some, you know, happy, some sad. And I get them to pull out one um, that expresses how they're feeling right now or how they're feeling about their last couple of weeks or their last month. And I get them getting in touch with those emotions and then talking to each other about those feelings and, you know, asking people, you know, do you feel the same way? Do you see it the same way? Really just getting them to talk. And then I kind of build on that as time goes on. Um, I found that it's not a quick fix. <gasps> that is actually brilliant. Um, I don't know if any of you ever heard of this, but there's something you can go online and find. It's called the Empathy Box. It was created by a couple of brilliant folks uh, out of Malaysia. And it came about as a way for someone who was new in the country to make friends. And she started to notice patterns over time uh, about how conversations, you know, being respectful of other people's cultures, being respectful of other people's, you know, are they introverts? Are they extroverts? What is this? And they started coming up with these patterns. And so they built this beautiful box of cards that if you're having trouble starting conversations, you can use this to help guide you. So if you're one of those people who are always bouncing in with a solution, 
uh, the cards actually help you step through and take it back a step to listen first. Um, yeah, highly recommend. I'm actually thinking about doing a talk on that this year because it's so important. But please look that up. It's a fantastic tool to have in your coaching toolkit. Sure, you know Land's work well as well, Zuzi. So feel free to chime in. So the Land's work is a great activity um, from organizational relationship systems coaching, where if you think of a cross-functional team with different roles, like software engineer, quality engineer, maybe designer, or, or or other roles, you can have them come together. You can do it online, or you can um, ideally do it in person. And first you have people go into their land. Here is the software engineer land. Here is the quality assurance land, the product manager land, let's say. And then the facilitator asks some questions. What is it like in your land? What is important here? What are, what are the challenges, for example? Then everybody leaves the land. So you, you make a wedge on the floor with tape. And then all of the people who are not product managers, please go sit in the please go stand in the product manager land. And then we ask questions. What's important to the prod product managers? What are the challenges? How can we help them succeed? And it's pretty cool. And then after the facilitator asks, for example, the product managers, what did they miss? What did they get right? What, what do you want to add? Things like that. It's pretty cool. All right, everyone, thank you so very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for your uh, session. Thank you.